Hello and welcome to our session. My name is Andrew Balmos. I'm a staff member at Purdue University's College of Agriculture and a electrical and computer engineering PhD student in Purdue's Open Ag and Technology Systems Center. Uh, today we're going to have a talk on Python and we're going to look at heat units as an example of one way to apply data science on the field. But before we get started, I just wanted to review where we left off last time. Professor James Krogmeyer, the co-founder of OATS, uh, gave two sessions at the 2019 annual conference on data wrangling in Python, where he looked at basic Python syntax, variables, loops, conditions, things like that. And he gave you an introduction to Pandas and, and Matplotlib to do some basic data science and plotting. Today, we're going to pick up from where he left off. We'll review a lot of those uh, later tools because they're going to be important uh, for our work today. Then we'll go back to some slides and discuss growing degree days and where they come from and how they relate to farming and decision making on the farm. And then we'll drop back into Python at the end and do some computations of GDU accumulations at a real field at the Purdue Acre Farm. Uh, for this session, we've produced uh, a Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter Notebook's a website that gives you this uh, real-time uh, uh, Python environment that allow you to create documentation and code side by side and then sort of run them step by step and see the output. You can sort of tweak it as you go. So it's a really nice way to develop um, some understanding your data and some basic algorithms. And then when you're done, you have this nice notebook that you can print out or email to someone and, and share what you've discovered. To get that working on your computer, you can uh, just install Juniper Notebook if you already have Python on your machine. So if you're already a user of Python and you know what pip means, then you can just go ahead and pip install Jupyter Notebook. But if that doesn't mean anything to you, then my recommendation is to look at uh, a package called Andaconda. Andaconda is really uh, a distribution of Python. It comes with Python and a lot of the side tools that, make, that are important for data science, like Pandas, and matplotlib and some other things. It all comes in one nice install package so you don't have to go out there and try to figure out how to install these different things. Um, but if you really just want to follow along with us today and you don't really want to worry about installing any software then you can go ahead and use this tool called mindbender.org. It's a free service that will allow you to load up any open source Jupyter Notebook and actually run the code. The code will be running on uh, my Bender servers, not on your computer. And the reason they've released this is really to just help people um, share uh, ideas in, in the open space. So uh, if you go ahead and just click this link here or I'll post it into the chat and comments for you uh, to use, it'll bring you right to the my Bender and load up our, our notebook. But if you'd prefer, you can also click this link here and bring you to our GitHub repository where we store some of these notebooks uh, for demonstrations like this. So I'm going to go ahead and click this link along with you. And you'll get a screen like this. And really, this is just uh, my Bender downloading and bringing up the server. This so will take a few moments for it to load. But once it loads, you should end up with a screen that looks something like this. And this is the code we're going to work through today. One little difference is when yours loads up, you should see some output in some of these cells. So as you scroll down, you'll see plots. You'll have code and comment in these boxes where we have dot, dot, dots. And we're going to go ahead and just sort of fill them in live as we talk. But you are looking at sort of the answer sheet. And feel free to go ahead and edit anything or make any changes while we're going through this uh, to, to get some practice. Uh, so it's just because you're in that MyBender live environment, all the code will run, but it just happens to sort of load with all the results already there for you as well. So this first cell this is where you would type code. And uh, if you want to run the code that's in this cell, then you can go ahead and click Control Enter. You'll see a little star formed here and then it changes to the number one. And that number one is saying that uh, it's the first thing that ran. And the star is saying that the code is currently running. So here, since it's a number one, we know the code is done running and we know that it was the first thing that ran. If you don't like uh, control enter, you can go ahead and click the run button up here in this UI toolbar as well. This code isn't doing anything all that special. It's just telling Python what libraries we would like it to load. Uh, you may not know what libraries you want starting out, but it's a kind of uh, a typical style to put all your imports on the very top. So as you're programming and you, and you run into the need for a new library, you would scroll to the top, add the import, and then go back down. 
So in this case, we're going to need three different libraries. The requests library, and that's new from last time. This is a library that allows us to make web requests uh, to um, uh, web services or web APIs to download data. And that's how we're going to get our weather data to play with. Where the second package is called pandas. And this as PD just means that we're going to be able to type PD instead of the word pandas. Okay, then the last library that we'll import is matplotlib and specifically the pyplot command uh, of that matplotlib library. And again, we're going to rename it to just plt because we're going to use this a lot and we really don't want to type matplotlib.pyplot. Okay, the second cell, we can go ahead and move to it and I'll hit control enter to, or actually I'm not going to run it yet. You're welcome to run yours. But what this is doing is, is really just a lot of styling stuff. So this uh, percent matplotlib is actually not Python code. This is sort of a directive to the Jupyter Notebook. And it's saying that anytime you see a matplotlib plot be generated, then take it and directly inline it into the output. So inline it into this text. And we'll, we'll see what that might look like in a little bit. There's uh, some other options you could use though. You could say type notebook, for example, and that's going to make the plot that gets embedded interactive. It'll allow you to zoom and, and play with the data. Now there's some downsides because that interactive plot requires you to uh, close it before you're running the next cell and some other negative things. So it's not great for like a notebook that you want to publish to the world, but it's really useful when you're trying to develop the notebook. So I'm going to go ahead and change the inline to notebook for our discussion. Now the next line is changing the styling of the plots. So PLT is referring to this matplotlib from before, style.use. Seaborn is just sort of a built-in style name. There's a lot of them out there you can choose from. I just happen to like it better than the defaults. It's not really necessary, um, but I think it just makes a little bit better pictures. These next lines here are essentially changing the font size of the plots that are being generated. And inside this uh, Juniper notebook, the figures are, the default figures are kind of small. So we're sort of make them bigger and make the text a little bit bigger. It's a little easier to read. Now, when you're using the notebook mode, you don't really want to play with these settings. They don't, they're, they're not that compatible. So I'm going to go ahead and just comment each one of these lines out. But again, if you're using the inline mode, then you should go ahead and leave them. So now that we have it set correctly, I'm going to hit control enter to run it. You can see it's the number two, so this box is done. Okay, moving on to cell number three. This is the cell where we fetch uh, all of our historical data. I'm going to go ahead and just start it running right now with control enter because this one takes a little while to run. So while it's running, we can talk about the data and where it comes from. Uh, we're going to use a service called ACIS to download the data. And I think the best way to look at that is to just go directly to their website. So if we open a new tab and go to rcc-acis.org, then we're, we'll be at the ACIS or Applied Climate Information Systems website. This is a service that's run by NOAA's regional climate centers, and it collects all sorts of data from a lot of different data sources and then uh, exposes it back out to the world over a completely free public API that you can make requests to. You don't even have to sign an agreement or make an account. It's as about as open of a data set as you can find. NOAA is really great about producing data sets like that. If you want to learn more about it, you can go to the documentation tab. And if you click data sets, for example, you'll see the, the different data sets that they bring in and use to, to fill in the holes and make a complete set. If you go to gridded data, that's just what we're going to use. That's sort of uh, an extension of the original ACIS data set where uh, a couple different groups have different models that will take that weather station data in and then produce a gridded set using an interpolation model. And it's usually gridded in lat lawn, so it's not, a, it's not really a, a nice uniform area grid like on the ground, but the, the lat lawn grid is usually is usually a 120th degree grid. So you're talking about something like a five kilometer by five kilometer um, on the ground square uh, it, near the equator and smaller as you go north and south. So it's a pretty good, it's a pretty fine grid when it comes to uh, macro scale weather like minimum and maximum temperature of a day. And then the last and, and the more interesting for us today is this web services tab. This is the documentation around hitting their API and downloading data. Now you can see that there's quite a few pages of documentation and this is really useful uh, once you're trying to get, do something really specific. But to get started, I find this ACIS query builder to be really helpful. So we'll go ahead and click that just to open it. 
And when you come, or when it loads, you can see that you have a choice between a, a few different data endpoints. And since we're looking for gridded data, we'll go ahead and click grid data. And now all you have to do is fill in this form and it'll generate the request for you. For example, you can put in your point location that you're interested in. Let's say it's lat long, negative 90.1 and 40. You put your start date and your end date in. So let's say January 1st of this year to January 31st of this year. You put in your grid, uh, and this is the interpolation model you want. We're going to go ahead and use the PRISM model for our examples, although there's some other models here you may be interested in for your use case. The PRISM model is ID 21, so we'll just go ahead and type 21 into this box. And then the last thing is elements. It's like, what elements do you want? Which data points do you want? And you can see there are lots of options. We've got maximum temperature, minimum temperature, average temperature, precipitation. They even compute things like cooling de uh, degree days. They actually have uh, growing degree days and heating degree days. So there are some things in here that are that uh, beyond just min and max temperature and precipitation that might be of interest to you. But for this work, we're just going to get min and max temperature and precipitation. So we do that by going over here to this name field, saying we want max T. We want it. To, we want the data either on a daily, monthly, or year, yearly interval. We would like it on the daily interval because we're going to compute GDUs from it. So we'll just type daily. Duration and summary are, are two fields that allow you to do some averaging on their server before pulling the data down, which can be really useful in some applications, but we want each daily number, so we'll leave them blank. And then finally, in units, we can choose which unit we want. So for temperatures, you got degrees uh, Celsius, Fahrenheit, and Kelvin. And for precipitation, you've got inches and millimeters. So we'll just do degree F. We can click Add Element, and you can see how it's added the request for us, a maximum temperature on the interval daily and units degrees F. And we can go over here and say we want the minimum temperature now, and we still want it in degrees F. We still want it the daily interval, so we click Add Element, and it just adds it for us. And then finally, we want the precipitation, and we'll get that in inches, and we'll click it. And now we have the three units we're looking for, and this request is complete. And if we go ahead and click Submit, the data will come back from the server. If we'll pick basic format here just to see it better, and you can see the format of the data is very simple. It's just a big list of arrays where the first element is the date, the second element is the first thing you asked for, the third element is the second thing you asked for, and the fourth element is the third thing you asked for. So in this case, it's maximum temperature, minimum temperature, and precipitation in degrees Fahrenheit and inches respectively. So it's a really easy API to use. So once we've kind of built our query, if we go back to our pandas example, then you can see that we've essentially just replicated that query here in the code. So we've created a couple of variables for convenience. We've defined the Latin lawn that we're interested in. This happens to be a particular field at Purdue's Acre Farm, this field in fact. And we've defined some begin dates and end dates for the data fetch. So we go from 1981 and January 1st, and that's because the PRISM model goes back to 1981. And we've asked till the January, or to December 31st of 2019. So essentially we've asked only for all the historic data where we have a complete year. It turns out that it's kind of hard to uh, work with data that has just one element different than all the others. So the 2020 data uh, isn't complete yet since we're not done with 2020. So it doesn't really fit. We're going to just not get it right now, and we'll see later when we need 2020's data, we'll fetch it separately and we'll sort of deal with it as a separate entity. We go ahead and make our request using the request library. It makes a post request to this URL, which you can get from the ACIS documentation, and it passes in that JSON object, which is the request we generated through their query builder. The result is JSON, so we ask requests library to parse it as JSON. And now we have a, this Python variable called W, which has all the data from ACIS, but it's not quite in a form that's really useful or easy to make a lot to do data science with. So what we're going to do is translate that W variable into a pandas data frame, and that's what this line does. So we got pandas pd dot data frame. We give it W index that data because remember that in that query builder output that list of arrays was under that key name data so what we've given what we've given the data frame is the a list of arrays we then told the data frame that the column names 
are in this are this and in this order date max temperature minimum temperature and precipitation and we saw that that's true with the query builder that the data comes back in the same order that we requested it now you may be asking yourself what is a pandas data frame well one easy way to think about it is it's an excel spreadsheet it's this uh, variable type that's going to allow us to uh, store or look at columns and rows make selections do sorting and filtering just like you could in excel and that's going to uh, really empower how quickly we can move forward with our analysis but data frames are even more than excel we won't really play with those features today but if you know anything about like an sql database a data frame is more like that it not only uh, feels like a table but you can also then do sort of advanced querying and you can uh, merge and, and sort and filter and query multiple data filter frames at once. And so that can be really powerful when you have multiple data sets. Okay, the last two things we do in this initialization step is we have pandas interpret the date column as an actual date time. So by default, the date column is just going to be a string of dates and pandas doesn't really know what that means. So what we do is we replace the date column with the output of this function, pd.2. Uh, date time and we give that function the original date column and so we have uh, uh, the identical column as we had before except now instead of being string dates it's a it's a field that Python understands as a date it's a lot like typing a date into Excel where then Excel notices and can treat it and format it for you uh, like it's a date and then the very last thing we do is we tell uh, this particular data frame that it should use the date column as its index. And what that really means is it's, is it's going to be much easier to sort uh, and filter for data by date by doing this. Now, normally the set index function would return a whole new data frame. W would exist and it wouldn't have an index. And then its return value would be equal to W as data, but it would have an index set uh, on the date column. So instead of that, but since we want w to actually just have the index itself we pass in this in place equals true and that tells python no don't return a new thing just mutate w right here and make w have the index that we asked for okay so that's kind of it for the data fetching part don't worry if that didn't make too much sense because this is sort of a, a getting in the weeds of making an api request and then we don't really need to look at it anymore uh, to do some of the analysis that we want to do for the rest of today. So you can see that uh, my number three has finished. So I have downloaded this 38 years of data and it's now in a data frame and ready to do stuff. So let's just play with uh, that object a little bit, get comfortable with pandas and, and what it does. And so I have a series of kind of tasks here and we'll just solve them together real quick. So the first one is to view the first few rows. So I'd like to see the first few rows of W. There's a lot of ways to do this, but one of the easiest ways is to just call head. So w.head. And when I hit control enter to run it, you'll see you'll get this table printed to the screen. It's the first five rows of W, or the head of the table. So it's pretty, and, and you can see we have uh, the three columns, max temperature, min temperature, and precipitation. And you can see that we have date as the index. Now we can go ahead and put a number in here if we want, say like 10, hit control enter, and now I get the first 10 rows. So you can put whatever number you want here. This is a really useful tool for when you just kind of want to get a feel for like what data is there, what columns are there, are they strings, are they numbers, are they like what's in the columns. Um, okay, so then the next task, moving later wrong, is to find the last few rows. And as you would expect, there would be a head function, there's a tail function. So we can do w.tail, and now we see the last five rows. Just like tail, we can give it a number, and we can get more than five if we want. Okay, continuing along, the task is print the column-wise statistics of the data. So we could do a lot of things. We could loop through this thing. We could compute all the statistics ourselves. But it turns out that pandas has a really nice function called describe, which... Uh, does it for you. So w.describe returns a brand new data frame. It's not indexed by date anymore. Rather, it's indexed by the statistic type. So count, mean, standard deviation, minimum, maximum, 25 percentile, and so on. And for each column, say maximum temperature, minimum temperature, and precipitation, you have the values of those statistics. So for example, the mean maximum temperature over the last 38 years at that field is 61.27 degrees. So this would be really useful for just trying to kind of get a feeling for 
what's the range in, in, of my data and what's it kind of look like? Uh, are they big numbers, little numbers? Are they wide dynamic range, little dynamic range, and so on? Okay. So now that we've been able to kind of see some of the data, let's look at how we might select a subset of the data to do something useful with it. So the first task is select the entire maximum temperature column. So I have the data frame and it has all these columns. I don't want to remove any of the data, but I only want maximum temperatures. Well, you just index it like it's an array, W at max T. And there you go. You have all your data, still 1, 000, or 14,244 data points but it's just date and maximum temperature. The next task is the same thing, uh, except for precipitation. And I'll just show you, there's another way you can do the dot operator. So instead of treating it like an array, you can treat it more like an object and say, give me the, the precipitation member. And we run that and it's the same thing. You have just the one column you're looking for indexed by date. Uh, um, and so it's just sort of a shorthand, if you will. Okay, now the last task is getting that date index itself. So you might think you can do uh, this, where you just say, let me index uh, W with the date with the name date, because that's what we called it. But you'll get an error, and it says key error date. And what that really means is this W doesn't have a key called date. Okay, that's interesting. Well, maybe I'll use the shorthand. Maybe that's better. Run that. Nope, data frame object doesn't have an attribute date. Well, it turns out when we told uh, Pandas to treat the date column as an index, it got rid of the date column and renamed it to index. So w.index actually is our date column now. So that's something you know, important thing to note as you want to play with the dates, you have to remember to call it index instead of date. Okay, we've looked at selecting columns, so now let's look at selecting rows. So the first task is to select rows 36 through 38. Well, easy enough, we just index W, and we can say I want to go from row 36, colon means 2, and in this case we want to say 39, because it's a non-inclusive range. So if you hit enter, now you have 36, 37, and 38, that happens to correlate to 1981, February 6th through the 8th, and we have the columns we're after. Now a couple of interesting things. If you would have said 36 colon, then you would have gotten the full data set from the 36th row onwards. Similarly, if you had done colon 38, you would have gotten the first 37 rows of W. So that uh, slicing of the arrays like that can be really useful sometimes. Okay, but because we told pandas uh, that the index was a date, we can do something even more interesting. We can ask it for the rows between two dates. So in this case, say March 4th, 1987 to May 6th of 1987. So we can do that just by saying W and indexing it. And we'll, give, we'll put the date in. And then we'll say colon, just like before. But now we'll put another date. And pandas is smart enough to realize, hey, this looks like a string, and I know that's a date, so let me parse these dates, uh, these strings as dates, and yep, they both parse to dates, so what you want is all the data between those two dates. And now it's really easy to get in there and grab the data that you want. Okay, last but not least, let's combine the two issues together. So the task is to select only the maximum temperature column, but from February 1st, 2002 to, to April 15th, 2002. So to do that, we can just uh, do our time index like we did before. So 2002, 0201, to 2002, 0415. If we run that, we have now the date range that we're interested in, but we have all the columns. So to get only the maximum T column, we can just index this new subset data frame with the max T. And now we have just our max T column from February 1st to April 15th. Okay, now that we're kind of comfortable with the basics of um, filtering and, and grabbing data out of a data of a data frame, let's get comfortable with the basics of, of matplotlib. So matplotlib is how we're going to generate all our plots. And to, to, to get started, let's just work through our first task, which is to plot all of the maximum temperature data into one plot. To do that, it's very simple. We're going to say plot.plot, plot, so that's plt.plot, and we're going to give it 
our max T column from our weather data frame. And I'm just going to go ahead and run this right now. And you'll see, hey, that was all we had to do. <clears throat> it gave us a plot that looks like the maximum temperature over the year. You can see the cycles over all the 38 years. And the x-axis, actually, that looks right. Somehow, matplotlib was able to tell that this data frame has a date index. And so that that x value should be dates. And then it did the right thing. And then it auto-scaled our y-axis based on the, the data's dynamic range. So before we move on, I just want to show you what we mean by that notebook mode for matplotlib. If you are looking at the version that loaded in my binder and, and the inline versions, and you'll notice that your figure is a little bit wider, but it's static. You can't do anything with it. In this case, I can actually resize the figure as needed. I can select this zoom function here and actually zoom into the plot. And then I can pick this pan option and actually move around in the plot. And then I can also go home if I want. And if you click this little save button, you can download whatever plot you had it set to at that moment. So it's really useful while you're doing the data analysis to be able to kind of interact with the plots because when you plot the data, you may not get the zoom and the scaling right. And rather than going back and having to tweak numbers in your code, just being able to kind of zoom in and pan around uh, can really save you some time. Okay, so we have a plot now, which is really nice, but it doesn't have any labels or titles. And so it's not that useful to other people. So let's go ahead and look at how we can add a label and a title. It's, uh, pretty straightforward. You're going to say plot like you will uh, pretty much anytime you work with matplotlib. And then you're just going to say y label. And you'll give it what y label you want. So we'll just say temperature. And you can see now that the y, the y label has that temperature. Okay, then we can say plot title to give the plot a title. And we'll say max temperature over time. And now the plot has the title, which is really nice. Okay, things are looking good, but uh, this x-axis is going to cause us a problem. So let me give you an example. If I kind of zoom in, eh, things are still looking good here. But if I zoom in even more, eh, it still looks good. Let's zoom in even more. Uh-oh. We're starting to get, like, uh, very hard to read. These dates are kind of overlapping. And as I zoom in even more, they actually overlap and they become almost impossible to read. So one good way to fix this problem is to rotate the text. Because these labels are kind of long, they're not just a number, uh, they don't really fit in this X space, but if we kind of rotate them a little bit so they're slanted, then they can kind of sit next to each other and not overlap even though they're long. So uh, the easiest way to do that is to say plot dot X ticks. And that means we're going to edit the, the ticks on the X axis. And we can tell matplotlib we want the rotation to be 25 degrees. So when we plot it, now the text is kind of slightly rotated. And as I zoom in and we get really close, uh, you still can read all the dates, just like you would expect. Okay, there's a couple other things I like to do for plots. Uh, these aren't necessary, but one of them is to call tight layout. And what that really means is there's a lot of white space in this figure. And when we call the tight layout, then uh, um, uh, the, the, the figure uh, kind of uses that white space and just gets a little bit bigger. It's a little bit easier to see what's going on. Okay, then the very last thing I like to do is, oh, I didn't mean to do that, I'm sorry. Let's put this back. Is I don't like that the output of this function is this command ellipses here, or it could be a lot of different, whatever the, um, by default it's whatever this last function of the code returns. So right now this ellipsis is the last function, and so that's what it returns. So you can go ahead and do plot.show. And inside of a Juniper notebook, if it detects that you've called a, mat, a matplotlib, uh, function and you don't call plot.show at the end of the cell it automatically calls it for you so you don't technically need it in a notebook but in, in most other environments you do need the plot.show to actually get the plot to pop up so I like to include it myself in even in a notebook just for that reason and uh, the nice thing is then Matt Juniper understands that the output of this cell is actually a plot and it kind of gets rid of that output Okay, so that's kind of all I have to say about this one plot. And that's kind of all the basic features of matplotlib, but we can get it to do some other cool, more advanced things. But before we move on, I want to be careful to show you, since this is an interactive figure, now that we're going to move to the next cell, we need to click this stop interaction button. That'll make this figure, uh, this figure uh, static and no longer interactive. 
And if we forget to do that, when we come down to this cell and we do some plotting commands, it'll actually change this plot and not create a new one. And so if you run this code at some point and you don't get a plot showing up, odds are if you scroll up a little bit, you'll see your plot and it's under the wrong heading. At that case, you can just run this cell again, hit your, your stop interaction button, and then come back down and run this cell again. Okay, moving right along, let's just do our next, our next task, and that is to plot both the 2019 minimum and maximum temperatures as separate lines, but on the same plot. So to do that, we need to get the 2019 data only. Remember, our W uh, has all the years in it. So since we're going to need it a few different places, I'm going to go ahead and just create a variable for it. We'll call it W19. And we'll get the, the data we're interested in by just doing a time index into the big W data frame. And we'll go from 2019 January 1 to 2019 December 31st. And now that we have a, a smaller data frame with just the 2019 data in it, we can go ahead and just call our, our plot.plot .plot functions like we were before and we'll just plot the W19 max T. And to get a second line, all you have to do is call plot again. So we'll do W19 min T. And fair enough, sure enough, we run this code, we get a plot, we have two lines now, there's the maximum and minimum temperatures. Now in this case, because we know the maximum temperature is greater than the minimum temperature, it's pretty obvious the blue is the max and the green is the, the min. But to avoid confusion, we should always include a legend to tell us what the lines mean. So to be able to include a legend, all we have to do is go to plot, and you guessed it, it's plot.legend. And legend takes an array of strings, and each string is uh, the label of the line in the same order that you called plot. So in this case, this first plot was max, was plotting the maximum temperature, so max temp, and the second plot call was plotting the minimum temperature, so min temp. So you run this, and now we have a nice legend to tell us uh, what this is in the future. Okay, we're all done with this task, so let's stop interaction and move on. The next plotting task is to plot both the 2019 minimum and maximum temperatures as separate lines on one plot, and then the 2019 precipitation on another plot. We want to make the two plots stack vertically and share the same axis. So essentially we want one figure with two plots on them and we want them separated one above the other. And we do it by uh, calling this subplot command. So here I've just left the answers for, for speed or for time's sake. So we go ahead and we can just call subplot and the first uh, parameter is the number of rows you want in the plot. The second parameter is the number of columns you want in the plot. And the third parameter is which figure number you want to deal with right now. So we're going to get two rows, one column. That'll give us two plots stacked on top of each other. And we would like to work on the top plot first. You notice that we've saved the, the output of this subplot command into a variable called AX. What happens is the subplot returns uh, uh, handled to the plot subplots axis and for at the moment let's just ignore it but remember we did that and we'll see why in a little bit. Now that we have our subplot activated we can just plot like we normally would. So just like in the last task we'll plot our W19 max T and our W19 min T. We'll have our legend, our Y label, and our title. And then that figure is done. Then we'll come back and we'll call the subplot command again. But this time we're going to still we're going to do two rows in one column, but we're going to use two instead of one to say we would like to work on the second figure, which is I mean the second plot of the figure, which is the bottom plot. Now in this case we're also going to pass it into this variable called share x, and we're going to say that's equal to ax. So what we're saying is this subplot, the second subplot, should share the same x-axis as whatever this variable's axis points to, which happens to be the axis of the first plot. And that's just how we're going to ensure that the two axes are always equal to each other, no matter what we plot. Okay, now that the subplot command is done, we can go ahead and just run our plot command like normal. And now we're plotting on the second figure. We can give that second figure a Y label and we'll rotate its uh, uh, figures. And actually we probably want to rotate the X ticks on the first figure as well. And then we'll call our normal uh, tight layout and show. So let's run this and see what happens. And sure enough, we have our two plots stacked on top of each other. The axes appear to be aligned. And if we come in with our zoom tool and zoom in an area, you can see that because the axes are shared, 
uh, the bottom plot actually zoomed in as well. And so we always have this sort of vertical alignment between our two plots. So that's really useful. Okay, that about does it for matplotlib plotting basics. Uh, so let's return to pandas and look at how we can group and reduce data. And then we'll ultimately see that that's going to be useful in making some more additional plots. So the first task is uh, to find the maximum precipitation for each year. So we have 38 years of data. What we'd like back is a vector that's 38 long with the maximum rainfall for, say, 1981 in the first one and the maximum rainfall for 1982 in the second index and so on all the way till the last index, which is 2019. And you might be wondering, well, how do we do that? Because right now we just have this Excel sheet, right? It's uh, like 14,000 rows long, and it's not really grouped in a way for us to easily sort of do a, a max function on. Well, Py uh, Pandas gives us the ability to group our data, and that essentially uh, gives us an array of data frames. It's not quite equal to an array of data frames, but when we group a data frame by something, we end up with many data frame like things where all the data in each one of those is the data that has that group by element in common. So I think an example will help. Let's just save this uh, group by into a variable because we're going to need it a few times. We'll call it by year. And uh, what we're going to do is say w, so the full weather data set, dot group by. And that's a function. And what we're going to pass into it is the thing to group by on. So here we'll say w, and we want to group by the date. So remember, we, that's the index. And because that index is a date index, there's this attribute called year. And that's going to take uh, just the year value for all 14,000 rows. And so when we're done, this uh, year by group by variable is going to have a sort of quasi data frame, if you will, for uh, of data, one for each year. And then what we can do is say by year and we'll do the precipitation column. So now we have selected uh, just the precipitation column out of each group and we can call kind of a reducer function on it, in this case max. And what that's going to do is for each group, it's going to go through and find the max of each group. And then when we're done, it's going to return a new data frame or a new series in this case where the index is the group by value, so in this case the year, and the value is the output of this reducer function, or the max. So when we run it, we see that we now have, for each year, the maximum rainfall that was uh, observed. So that's really useful. But now what happens if we want to uh, compute a couple of different reductions on the, to the same groups, and but then treat the output as a data frame? For example, Let's say we want uh, uh, the maximum max temperature and we want the minimum minimum temperature. So something like this. But I'd like to, to have them treated as one variable, one data frame. Well, the way we can do that is called the pandas.concat function. So we'll do uh, pd.concat. And we'll give it an array where the first element of that array is the max or that first column we'd like to join. The second element of the array is that min or the second column we would like to join. And if we just run this, for example, you'll see, oh wait, they didn't quite do what we wanted. What it appears to have done is just taken this vector and stacked it on top of this vector. And we now have one really long time series where the times sort of repeat. So what we can do is tell uh, pandas, no, 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 you misunderstood me. What I want you to do is to join it on the other axis. So not on axis zero, which would be sort of stacked on top of each other, but axis one, which would be sort of stacked next to each other. So as we uh, run that, we can see, oh, now that our two columns got stacked next to each other. And when they shared the same date field, they got sort of merged into a row. And so now we have this uh, new data frame with this sort of maximum max temperature minimum and minimum temperature okay let's see how we can use some of these groups and reductions and to plot things so the task here is to make an air bar plot of temperature over a year so what we mean by this is um, we would like the average temperature of january 1 uh, displayed with its variance so the 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 variance of January 1's temperature over all our years and then we would like the mean temperature of January number of January 2 uh, as well as a representation of January 2's 
uh, uh, standard deviation and so forth. So to do that, we need to group our data by the day of year. So we need to be a map January 1 to 0 and January 2 to 1 and so on without regard to the year. Well, it turns out Pandas has got our back. We can do a, a we can create a by day variable and we'll we'll group our weather data frame by w.index or that date field times day of year. And so Pandas can already kind of compute this mapping of January 1 to 0, January 2 to 1, and so on without regard to year. It's already available for you, and it's called day of year. And so now we have uh, our, our group, and we have all our data for all of, of, all of each individual day of the year ready to be reduced on. And so we can go ahead and just work on our plot. And so we can say plot.airbar. That happens to be a type of plot that Matplotlib knows how to make. And the first parameter of the error bars is the x-axis. So in this case, it's the, the day of year. One thing we could do is just assume there's 366 days out of the year because every once in a while we have a leap day. But it's kind of nicer to tie it back to our data source. So that way, if the data changes in the future, the plot doesn't break. So one way to ask a group by for all of the keys that it has grouped on is uh, by, by going to the group by variable and then asking it for its groups and then asking for the keys. And so this ends up essentially in this case going to return a vector that's 0 to 365 and that's because there's 366 days uh, when you have a year with a leap year, a leap day in it. Okay, the second column is the average value. So we'll have our by day variable, we'll get our maximum temperature and we'll ask it for the mean. So that's the mean across uh, all the years. Uh, for each day and then the second or the third parameter is the standard deviation parameter so we'll get our by a day we'll get the maximum temperature and we'll ask for the standard deviation we can go ahead and plot that ah and i just ran it but i didn't see it i didn't get a plot and that's because our last plot which was way up here i forgot to uh, stop the interaction you can see that it's actually changed our plot so i'm gonna go ahead and run this one again so we get our good plot back we're going to stop our interaction. We'll come back down to our cell and run that one again. And sure enough, now we have the 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 air bar plot that we were looking for. And just to kind of get a better idea of what it does, we'll zoom in and you can see it shows you the average as well as visualizing the standard deviation for each day of the year. Okay, so let's move on to our final plot that we'll do before we start talking about GDUs. And that's just to combine uh, data from a data frame and data from a group by. And you can see that there's sometimes some uh, annoying things that come up. So uh, the task is to just display the average minimum and maximum temperature on top of the uh, 2019 data. So we're looking for one a plot that's of one year span. We'll plot the 2019 data. Uh, and then on top of that, we'll overlay the curve, the average curve using all of the historical data. So on the surface, it doesn't seem that complicated. And actually, it's really not, but we'll, we'll have some caveats. So the first thing we can do is just run our plot command. And we know we want to plot the, the maximum temperature. And then uh, we know we want a second line, and that should be the, the minimum temperature. And then we know we want to plot the average. And we've already computed the average, right? We have our by day variable from before. And we can get the maximum temperature column and we can just ask for the mean easy enough and then we can do the same thing we can get our by day grouping we can get the minimum temperature and then we can just ask for the mean and i think that should be enough so we'll just run it and see what happens and i forgot to stop the interaction again so we'll just run it and see what happens and uh oh we have an error and we get this crazy um, error message. View limit minimum negative 36,870.15 is less than one and is an invalid matplotlib date valid. Well, this first part doesn't really matter that much to us, but this is the key. It's an invalid matplotlib date value. And what's invalid? Well, if we go back and think about it, remember the index of a group by once it's been reduced is the group by value. So it's going to be a number between 0 and three, 356. And, 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 but the index of W19 is actually dates. So that's going to be a problem. What we need to do is teach pandas how to map 
the um, zero to 356 back to an actual date so that they agree, so that these, these plot commands agree with these plot commands. So the easiest way to do that is to define something called a date range. I'm gonna go ahead and put it into a variable here because we're gonna need it a few more times. But the general idea is that pandas has a function called date range and, and what date range takes is its first parameter is a starting date. So in this case, it's gonna be January 1st, 2019, and then a number of periods. So we'll just say 365. By default, the period is a day. So this date range is going to be the entire year of 2019, or in other words, it'll be 2019, January 1, and then 365 days afterwards. So it'll be December 31st. You can change the, the um, um, period, so you can say hours, minutes, seconds, months, and so on. And so it's a really convenient way of producing uh, a, a series of dates when you know it's regular and you know the period. Um, so, But what we can go ahead and do then is just give this plot command this y19 variable as its first parameter. When we give it two parameters, what we're saying is use this as the x and use this as a y. And so now this plot line should work because we're telling it what days each one of these means correspond to. So we'll go ahead and we'll add uh, that to this line here and we'll run it and, and sure enough, we now have a plot. But it's not quite the plot we expected because there should be four lines, not two. So these two seem to work, but these may, maybe still haven't. And um, we see here, we actually we have an error and it's actually this line. Let's scroll down and it's saying X and Y must have the same first dimension, but one has shape 365 and the other 366. So one is one longer than the other. So in this case, this mean is one longer than this date range. So we've got a couple of options. We could come up here and make this 366, and now all of a sudden it plots, which is nice. Or what I prefer in this case is to uh, leave it 365 and then just, um, slice out the first 365 values of this mean. And if we run that, it also works. And the reason I prefer this is because later on, we're going to have the same problem where we're trying to merge data together. And we won't always have that 366 point, only on years with a leap year. And since that leap year happens in the middle of the, in the, middle of the winter and we're trying to compute GDUs, that happens during the growing season, we don't usually care about that day anyway. So the easiest thing is just kind of lop it off and ignore it exists. Uh, that doesn't always work in your analysis, but in this case, it's a simple way to get by. Because the last thing I'd like to do is just kind of clean up this plot a little bit. I don't like that the daily values are being shown as a line because the daily values, there's no real, any real belief that it's a continuous thing. They're more of like discrete data points. Uh, now the average value, if you, you might be able to argue that with enough years averaged together, we would expect this sort of average signal to be pretty continuous. So I'm okay with that being a line, but I like the the um, dots or the uh, the um, daily values to be dots maybe instead of lines. And we can achieve that really easily by giving this another parameter. And there's a huge list of symbols. So a period is one of them to be, uh, and that tells Matplotlib to plot it as a as a series of dots instead of a line. Okay, and if we'd like to change the colors, I actually like the default colors here, but I'd like to just show you. If you like wanted to change the color of this one to blue, you can just add a B in front of it, maybe the line to this one to green. Um, and then maybe we wanna plot our averages as black and K is black. And you can find in the matplotlib documentation these different uh, uh, um, letters and what they map to. We'll go ahead and run that, and there we go. We now see that we have blue dots and green dots and a black line. I'm gonna actually go ahead and put them back to their default colors because I think they're a little bit nicer. Okay, we've successfully made it through our pandas and matplotlib tutorials. Let's go back to the slides. The whole thing is based on growth stages. So growth stages in a corn plant, or in really any plant that's like a corn plant or like a grass, like a sor sorghum or a barley or wheat or or anything like that, they have these sort of stages of growth and you can usually track them by knowing how to what to look for on the plant. So for corn, for example, the first set of stages is called the vegetative stage and that's really when the, be, before the, 
the the kernels of the corn are actually starting to develop it's really just all plant matter and we can record the stage uh, for a corn plant by looking at what they call the leaf collars and so if you look carefully in this photo some of these leaves have this sort of line underneath it and they call that a a collar. If you look at some of these upper leaves here, there's no real collar. They're still being developed. And so these are leaves are actually kind of growing up through the stalk and, and pushing out. And eventually they'll push out far enough that the collar will be exposed. And when that collar gets exposed, we'll go from uh, um, the fifth collar to the sixth collar. And so we use these collars to define the stages and we usually refer to them as the V stages. So VE is for emergence. So this is the plant ha has some sort of um, uh, shoot and leaf unfurled, but no visible collar. And then V1 is that as the stage where the first visible call or the first collar is visible. V2 is when the second collar gets visible and so forth. And it turns out that these collars being coming visible correlate to um, uh, root development as well. So you get these these rings of roots that, that, are, that are associated with each collar. The growth stages can be useful for a lot of reasons, but they can also sort of tell you what's going on in the plant, and that helps you understand what you need to do. So for example, at V6, that's about when the growing point has reached the soil. And that's when the buds for the ear and the tassel develop, and that's really when you see brace roots form. That's where these roots that are actually above ground and then come back down into the ground. At this stage of, the, of a corn plant, what you can and can't do it to it dramatically changes because the, the, the ear and tassel bud is formed and because those roots are exposed, uh, you can damage the plant, you can stress it in different ways than before that. Okay, and then the vegetative stages continue. We continue to get more and more leaf collars as the plant gets uh, larger. And eventually we get to our final one, VT, that's V tassel. And that's when this tassel, what looks like this right here, starts forming. The plant has gotten to its maximum height at this point. The tassel contains the pollen, which will pollinate the silk of the ears and, and produce the kernels. And so once that tassel forms and, and grows to full size, and then the ear, shortly after, the ear will, uh, will emit silk. And that's when we've uh, become moved from the vegetative stage to the reproductive stage. There are six stages of reproductive, uh, silking, blister, milk, dough, dent, and maturity. And they are all represent development within the corn cob and the kernels themselves. And the plant, from a vegetative perspective, is done growing. All of the energy is now put into growing the cob and the kernels. So the silking stage is when the silk just emerges, and a silk is this uh, um, a silk is this this little fibrous thing here that goes from each oval on the cob out and out, out down the length of the cob and out the bottom. And when the silk emerges within a few days of that, the nearby corn plants will drop their pollen and that pollen will fertilize the silk, which will fertilize the oval and the oval will start growing into a kernel. And the blister stage uh, is sort of, the silk has detached from the kernel and you can see it's kind of shriveled up here because it's no longer attached to anything. And if you were to open up the kernel, a kind of a clear fluid would, would emerge. And as the, the kernels continue to grow, we enter the milk stage, and that's sort of uh, defined by the, that fluid kind of getting this sugary uh, milk-like appearance. This is the stage, actually, that we harvest sweet corn. So it's that uh, milk that's, that's the sweet, tasty part of the corn for, for humans. But for like field corn, we continue to let it grow, and we get into the R4 stage, or the dough stage, in this stage, you can start seeing the embryo just starting to form and the milk starts solidifying. As we continue growing, we get into the dent stage, so-called because the corn kernels uh, end up with these little dents on the top of them. And in this case, the embryo is much larger now and the milk has really uh, begun to solidify uh, almost all the way through. And then the final stage is maturity and that's where our uh, embryo is full grown, the uh, fluid has fully solidified, and this thing called a black layer has formed, and this is sort of a layer of material that actually separates the kernel from the corn plant, so no nutrients can pass in either direction. And this, at this point, the corn kernel is fully grown, it, it can't get bigger or smaller, it's ready to be harvested. And so that black layer is key. Uh, the, the whole point of the game is to plant the seed and get it to black layer. 
So you might ask yourself, well, what's the point of all this? Well, actually, knowing the stages and knowing what stage your field's in, it really drives your plant, your plant care and therefore the logistics of your farm. So for example, there's certain herb, herbicides and fungicides that can only be applied at certain stages without causing stress or, or damage to the plant. Sometimes it's pre-V3, sometimes it's post-V6, and so on. Uh, the other, some, some other surprising results. So the number of kernels that are going to be in the quab, which is really important for yield, is actually defined in v, stage V6 through V12. So that may be even before you really see a cob on the plant. In V6 to V12, soil moisture, nutrients availability, other types of stress are really important to control if you can, because that's going to ultimately have a direct impact on your yield. And there are certain diseases and pests that are more susceptible of causing problems at different uh, stages of growth. So there may be a certain pest that happens very commonly at VE to V3. And so when you're in that stage, you know you should be looking for that. And maybe there's a different pest that's more like V10 to V15. So when you get into that range, that's when you should be scouting for those pests. So you can see knowing the field state of your, of your uh, crop can really help you dr help drive your farm logistics. So how do we know the field state? I mean, we can go out there and scout it, but if I'm out there scouting it, then I can look for these problems anyways. Well, it turns out if you count the heat, you can pretty much estimate the field state. And what we mean by that is this plot here. This is data that we've gotten from the literature, and this is a well-known result, by the way, and people have been doing this for a long, long time. And what it does is it takes for a lot of different corn varieties, um, uh, this ratio of the accumulated GDDs into the field, uh, at th this point in the year since the plant date, divided by the total number of GDDs needed to get to black layer, which is a number that you can get from the manufacturer of the seed. And when you plot them, you see that there's a really linear relationship between the total uh, percentage of accumulated GDD to the current stage of the, the crop. And what that really means is that a plant, like a corn, it really just grows based on how much heat energy you give it, which makes sense that heat energy is what's kind of causing all the reactions and allowing the growth to happen. And so once you give it a certain amount of heat, it'll have produced a certain amount of growth. And even in the reproductive stage, it's true. Now the relationship's slightly different, but it's still linear. And so if we can track or know how many GDUs have been accumulated in the field since planting date, we can actually estimate the, the field state without ever going out there. And that will, if you can see all that at once, that would really help you make logistical decisions. What field should I go visit today? What field should we spray today? Or, hey, we're scheduled to spray this field with this particular herbicide, but I think that, or this, based on GDD, we may be out of the appropriate range. So someone go out there and check before we go spray it and kill the plants, and so on and so forth. So what do we mean by counting the heat? Well, it turns out that it's a pretty simple scheme. You just take the average temperature, uh, of each day. So GDUs is T high plus T low divided by two. It's important to note that the unit of GDE, GDU here is actually degrees times day. So a GDU is how many degrees that plant was exposed to over one day's period. Now we often don't write times a day because it doesn't change the actual value, but this is where this term growing degree day comes from. It's actually the growing degrees times days. Um, but it can be a little confusing if you don't know the origin of the of the unit. Sometimes people just re prefer growing degree unit because it avoids that confusion or just even more simply heat unit. It turns out though that studies have shown that, that, that plants, they don't really actually grow very appreciably when the temperature is too low. And this varies by plant type and we usually call it the base temperature. So for example, corn, the base temperature is usually taken as 50 degrees Fahrenheit. If the, if the temperature is below 50 degrees, the corn won't grow at all. So to account for that, we can just take our average temperature and subtract the base temperature. That's the number of degrees over that threshold that we've observed in a day. And this is kind of the standard formula that's still applied in most cases. And then lastly, studies have also shown that over a certain temperature, the plant doesn't grow any faster. So for corn, that's 86 degrees. So if you have plant if you have corn growing and it's 90 degrees out, it's not growing any faster than if it was 86 degrees. And we need to account for that because those four degrees, if not accounted for, will make the crop look like it's more advanced than it really is. We'll deal with that in a little bit because it's not, we don't really have a nice clean solution for it. 
And you might ask yourself, well, why is this the equation for GDU? Well, it's actually pretty simple. Uh, and, uh, if you take a day and you imagine that it has a nice sinusoidal temperature profile, so we go from our low temperature to a higher temperature and back to our low from midnight to midnight, and, uh, and, and it follows a nice sinusoidal pad pattern, then the heat unit really is just the area of the underneath that curve down to the t base temperature, or this integral here. And I wouldn't be an academic if I didn't find a way to get an integral on my slides for you, but that's okay. We don't actually need to evaluate this integral. Um, although if, you, if, you're, if you've stayed brushed up on your calculus, you might notice it's really not that complicated of one. But we can solve it by computing the areas in two parts. So if we look at just the area underneath the, the sinusoid, but none, none of the, the rectangle below it, then we'll notice that we have a sinusoid that's been shifted to be just positive. And that has an area of amplitude times length. So in this case, the amplitude is t high minus t low divided by 2, and the length is 1 day. We then can account for the area of the rectangle, and that's simple, it's just height times length. So in this case, it's t low minus t base, that's the height of the rectangle, and again, the length is one day. Now if we take this equation here, which is summed together, is the total area underneath that curve, or equal to that integral, we can just kind of work through some um, algebra and simplify it. And when you do that, you end up with the formula that we've seen, t high plus t low over 2 minus t base times a day, or in other words, the average temperature minus the base temperature times one day. So that's where it comes from. That makes a lot of sense. And since our historical data often only has highs and lows recorded, uh, this is a really convenient uh, formula to apply because we have the data to do it. It has some caveats, though. So for example, what if the average temperature is less than the base temperature? Well, in that case, our GDU accumulation would be negative. But we know that just because it's cold outside, the plant doesn't shrink. And so that doesn't really m match our model very well. Our typical solution is just to replace negative GDU days with zeros. Um, now, that has an impact of it's possible that we have a day where the average temperature is below the base. But for any given for a few hours that day, the instantaneous temperature was above the base. And in that case, some growing would have occurred. But uh, that happens pretty rarely, and it really usually happens very early in the season when it's still kind of uh, transitioning into spring or, or and into summer. And there's not a lot of GDU accumulations in that time frame anyway. So it turns out that usually if we ignore that, we replace the negative values with zeros, we don't really get a large error, and it's acceptable in practice. The last caveat is, what if our high temperature is greater than our maximum temperature, like that 86 degrees we talked about before? Well, it turns out what we usually do is just replace that day's max or high temperature with the max. So if the high was 80, I'm sorry, if the high was 90 degrees Fahrenheit for corn, we would have just made it 86 before computing the average value. In essence, what we've done is computed the area under this orange curve instead of under the blue curve. But you can see we missed some area that we should have had. If we took our, our profile and actually just cut it out on our max flat here and then let it fall back down sinusoidally again, that we would have accounted for this yellow area here. But what, by replacing the, max, the high temperature with the max, all we've really done is accounted for the area underneath this orange curve. Now that's some error, but it's standard practice to do it this way. It's how most of the data that's published is published and uh, it would require a higher resolution data, like maybe hourly even better, to do much better to be able to compute the area under that orange curve more accurately. And since we don't have historical data like that, or it's not as easy to access, it's pretty common to just ignore this problem. And at the end of the season, the error is, is still reasonable. Okay, for the last part, let's jump back to some Python and look at how to compute GDD curves uh, for a particular field. So we'll see in our first cell that we have a, uh, an ACIS request, just like we started with in the very beginning, except this time we have a plant date of 425, and the current date is July 1. Now that you would, of course, want to change this date to whatever the current day is for you when you're running this code. We've also noted here that for the variety of corn we've planted in this plant, that's this decalb variety, hypothetically at least, the decalb says that there needs to be 2,594 GDUs accumulated before you get to black layer. We've also noted, the, noted this T max and T base variable when we've picked uh, the standard 86 and 50 for that. 
So I won't go into the details here. This basically does the exact same request as before, except it's only asking for the data from the plant date to the current date. So we'll go ahead and run that. This is much faster than before because we're only asking for a few months of data. Okay, now that we have our data, let's scroll down and uh, complete the first task, and that's compute the current GDU accumulations for the field. So we stored all the data into a variable called W field, and so we'll use that uh, to get started. The first thing we need to do is make sure that the maximum temperature in that array is been thresholded to our Tmax, just like we talked about a few minutes ago. So to do that, we can say W field. And we're going to index the W field by uh, W field dot max T uh, conditioned on this greater than max T. So what we're trying to say here is take all of the rows of W field where the ma where the max T is greater than our T underscore max. So now we have a data frame, which is our original W field, except only the rows where this condition is true. And then we're going to select our max T column from it. And we want to make that equal to T max. So essentially we're saying for all the cases where T max is too big, change the T max value to our T underscore max, which is 86 degrees. Let's go ahead and run that and make sure there's no error and things look good. Now we can go ahead and compute the GDU value. We can uh, create a new column into a data frame by just uh, index acting like it's there and indexing it. And since it is, since this is an assignment, pandas will realize that we, what we want it to do is create a new column and call it GDU. So that's really convenient. And what we need to do is compute the average temperature and then subtract the base, just like our formula. So we can do that by saying W field max T plus W field min T divided by two minus T underscore base. So we'll run that, things look good. And now we wanna make sure that any negative value that we may have just computed is replaced by a zero because that's how we handled a, a too cold of a day. So we'll do it just like we did on that first line. We'll take W field and we'll index it uh, under the condition that GD, GDU is under zero. Oh, it looks like I called it GPU, let's call this GDU. <clears throat> And I have this GPU column here, but we can just ignore it. Uh, and then, so for all of the cases where it's less than zero, we'll go ahead and select the GDU column and set that equal to zero. And we'll run that. And here you can see that there's a problem. It's like, well, it worked up here, but why is it not working here? Well, it's really, there's some scenarios where modifying a data frame like this uh, works and some other scenarios where it doesn't work. And it's not hard to see the problem uh, if you think critically about it. This condition here sort of returns a new data frame. It's sort of like a slice of the bigger data frame. It said, go take our bigger data frame and then only find the rows where this condition is true. And then index into that new data frame on the column equals GDU and then set all those to zero. But what we're really doing is we're, we're, we're adjusting the, that new data frame, not the original one. And it turns out that um, pandas can sometimes figure out what we mean and sometimes we can't. And this warning is really just telling us, hey, there's a way to do this so that it always works. And what it wants us to do is to use this field called dot lock. And dot lock is a way for us to um, tell pandas exactly what row indexer we want and what column indexer we want. So in this case, this is the row indexer and this is the column indexer. And so we can go ahead and sort of write it like this. And what we're telling pandas is, hey, go find all the rows in the W field where this is true, and then find the column, and then set all those columns of this original data frame to zero. And so to be safe, I'm gonna go up here and just uh, modify this to work the same way. We'll go up and let's run this again just to make sure we get a we reset our data and then we'll run this again, and now the error is gone and we're right where we wanna be. Now the final thing to do is to compute the field GDU, and I'm gonna go ahead and put it into a, a variable because we'll need it later. And that's as simple as just taking our field data frame, indexing it by date, but we wanna do it from the plant date going forward, so we can just leave an empty set of plant date all the way to the end, which is the current date, because that's all we can ask for data for. We get the GDU column, 
that's a vector now of numbers and then we can call sum on it to sum them all up and then to see the value we can go ahead and just type it to print it out and so we so far this year we have accumulated 1091.5 GDUs on that field so we go ahead and move on to our next task which says which is asking us to estimate the current growth state and we use that by using those formulas we saw on the slides. I'm going to go ahead and just copy paste some code in here real quick for time's sake. But essentially all it's doing is taking the field GDU that we just computed, dividing it by the GDU to black, which came from the manufacturer, multiplying by 42 and subtracting 2.23 to compute the vegetative stage. These numbers come from a best fit line from the data in the, in the literature. Similarly, for the reproductive stage, it's the same form, formula, except we've got two different coefficients. I go ahead and run this and we can see that the current these formulas are predicting that it's currently in 15 stage 15 v15 it's about halfway through it and the r value is negative and what that's really saying is we haven't gotten to the reproductive stage yet either so we know that our estimate is of the of the of that field is currently v15 Okay, so moving on to our next task, we would like to make a plot of all of the past year, uh, historical GDU curves that have ever happened. So again, for time's sake, I'm gonna go ahead and just copy paste some code in here and then we'll talk through it quickly. We've seen almost all of this, so, we shouldn't, so it shouldn't be too much of a surprise. Uh, just like in the last time, we're gonna need this date range that tells us all the dates of year 2020, so that way we can plot the group by data along with the data frame data. We're going to go in here and, and we're going to make a copy of W. So this is sort of new, but what this is telling pandas to do is to take W and produce a brand new data frame, all the exact same data in it, and store it as W corn. And that allows us to mutate W corn without breaking or affecting anything in the W a variable. And the reason we need to do that is we're going to modify W corn based on those corn equations or based on those corn 8650 uh, you know method. So just like we did a few steps ago, we're going to find all the maximum temperatures that are over the max and set them equal to T max. Then we're going to compute the GDUs out of all the data and store that as a GDU column and then we're going to find all the negatives and make them zero. And so when we're done, we've now computed the GDD, GDUs of every day of all the historical data going back to 1981. So then we'll go ahead and uh, group that GDU column by the year because we're interested in looking at um, uh, the curves per, by year. And then we're going to call the cum sum on that group by. And cum sum stands for cumulative sum. And what that really means is for each year, on January 1, the value will be its value. On January 2, it'll be its value plus January 1's uh, value. On January 3, it'll be the, the previous sum plus January 3's value. On January 4, it'll be the previous sum plus January 4's value, and so on, all the way to the end. And so you'll have this vector that sort of grows with time each day, adding its, uh, its value to the overall value, which is uh, kind of what a plant does. It sort of accumulates all those growing degree days and turns it into corn. Okay, then what we're going to do is, is do this for loop, and we haven't really looked at for loops yet, but it, but this is, uh, is simpler than it originally appears. What we're going to do is take this new data frame that we have, which is now indexed by year and has um, uh, ser uh, time series of, that's equal to the cum sum for each year stored at each index, and we're going to group by it again, but this time, and we're going to group on year, right, because this is now a data frame. So there's lots of entries for say year 2020, I'm sorry, for say for year 2000, and we need to get them back into groups by year. So we take our curve and we group by year again, and then we put it in this for loop. And what this for loop does is uh, gives us the year, so say 2000, and that particular group, so year 2000's group, and it'll call the code underneath this for loop once for each year and give it the curve uh, it, and give the associated curve with it each time. And so what we can do is just call plot.plot .plot, where we plot the curve, that year's curve, against the year 20, 20, year 20 um, labels so that they all kind of stack on top of each other. And then we can directly label this curve with the year and this will make the legend uh, produce automatically. 
and then we finish up with our, our, our normal labels and plots. And so if we go ahead and run this, what we should see is a plot that shows all the growing degree curves that we've, ever, we have, that we've seen in the last 30 years all drawn on top of each other, aligned up by date. And with that, we can, oh, I have forgotten to remove our interactivity again. So let's come back down and run this again. And what you can do is kind of visualize how much year after year the GDU, uh, GD, GDU curve can vary. And you can see there's quite a bit of variation, right? So when we get towards the end of the year in harvest season, uh, you know, come uh, October, we can sometimes have as low as maybe 2,600 growing degree days and as high as maybe 36. So you can be like a thousand growing degree units of total accumulation different. And so obviously the, um, when the corn's ready for harvest from this year to this year will be very different. Okay, the very last thing I'd like to show you is sort of where all this is heading, and it's to visualize uh, some of that risk and uh, do a projection in the future so that you can try to estimate the day that something would be available. Since we're running out of time, I'm going to go ahead and just run this curve, this code, and I'll just leave it as an exercise for you to, to try to read and understand. And instead, we'll just jump right into the, to the plot and, and see its value. And so what we're seeing here is uh, the plot starting on the plant date. So on the plant date, there's zero GDDs accumulated. Now, there's obviously been GDDs accumulated so far this year. But for that seed that got planted, there are zero on the plant date. And then the orange line that we have here is this current year's, year's 2020's GDU curve. The uh, blue line we see, the dark blue line going up, is the average DDU curve that we see, have seen historically. And the light blue shaded region is sort of the extreme of the plot before. So it's, you know, it's the extreme of all the variation that we've seen. And so as we're looking at this, we can kind of get a feeling for how are we doing so far this year on GDUs? So it looks like we were cold uh, early in the season, but then we were kind of unseasonably warm and we've kind of caught up. And so we're actually sitting kind of right at the average value, even though we had a cold snap in the beginning. And if we zoom in a little bit, what we've done is drawn a line here. And this is, this is the number of GDUs this particular variety needs to get to its next stage or stage 16. And so if we take our orange line, which is our current dot, and then sort of project it forward using this, uh, the, the derivative of this average curve, we can see that we should expect to see about January, I'm sorry, July 2nd is when we hit our next stage. So if you look down here in this corner, you'll see the date of my, of my mark. And so probably by the time people are watching this video, uh, that field has already transitioned into V16 or V, uh, yeah, V16. And so this is sort of the, the basis of, a, of an app we're working on. It's called Grow. And the app will use this ACIS data and it'll uh, combine with you putting your field coordinates, your plant date, and your variety information into a Google a Sheet. We're able to generate a map that'll show you all of your fields, the current GDU accumulations, the current estimated uh, crop state. You can look at it as a map or a list view. And then you can, that will help you understand sort of where the fields are, where they're heading, and what sort of the order of things need to be done in. And it's interesting because if you look at the early season, the curve's not very steep, meaning in early in the season, and it's even less so, actually, if we kind of look up here, you can see in the early season, this curve's very flat. So if I plant a corn early in the season, and then a few weeks later, I plant another field, maybe over here, there hasn't really been that many GDUs accumulated in the first field. And then they both sort of together start working up this curve. It turns out that in the beginning of the season, we may have a couple of weeks between those two uh, corn. But by the end of the season, maybe we only have a day or two. And that's because in those first two weeks, there weren't very many GDUs accumulated. And so they basically accumulated GDUs together once we got into the warmer part of the season. And so plant order doesn't necessarily mean uh, that's your order of inputs and your norm order of operations and your order of harvest. A combination of plant date, the GDU curve, and the varieties GDU to black layers um, really controls that. And so the app helps you sort of visualize that uh, for your whole farm. 
Uh, thank you for listening, and I hope that was interesting and that you learned something about Python. Please remember the Juniper notebooks are going to be available on GitHub forever, and with that MyBender service, you can play with this code whenever you want.